Well, I'm very excited, and I mean very excited for our time today. We have an extraordinary guest, and I, I praise all the guests that I have come on uh, from different ends of the spectrum, from those who are ministers, those who are world-class researchers, which is what we're going to have today. And so I'm really excited to have Dr. Richard Swartz, otherwise known as Dick Swartz. Um, he is a world-renowned researcher. When I went back to grad school, when I was in grad school in 2007, his IFS model was a cornerstone in terms of attachment, trauma, and healing. And uh, the IFS parts work, you'll find it in many different researchers' works. Um, he's been doing research since 1980. His internal family systems, which we're going to get into, his model is so applicable to researchers, to clients, clinicians all around. And around 1982 is when that was established. And then really since then, it has been very much um, a part of the therapeutic approach um, for many different modalities. And um, he is also, if you want to get in contact with more of his work, he has many different works, probably over 25 different books. You can go to ifs-institute.com. And uh, I'm really excited. There's a, a book that he's got coming out in July that we're going to hear a little bit more about. Dr. Richard Swartz, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Carl. Very happy to be with you. I really appreciate your interest and enthusiasm. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I just want to say for our listeners, uh, part of why I'm really excited about today is that I went to an interview, I'm sorry, I went to a training last month where he did an extensive uh, multi-day training on parts work. And um, I'm going to be doing more on parts work because I think it's something that you can literally deploy into whether you are in the church and you're sitting there and you're figuring out how do I get a hold of this crosstalk in my head or you're a professional or your clinician I want to do more on this because I think that we need to really explore the blend between faith and parts of self I think there's an incredible marriage there but um, what he's going to do today is not just we're going to learn a little bit about parts but we're going to get into something that I think is um, at the is incredibly important, and that's legacy burdens um, as it relates to racialized trauma and how we fo how we really work through how to heal um, from our society, the way our society is constructed and so forth. And so we're going to get into that. I've got many different questions for him, and some will be a little bit more geared to a broad orient audience, and then others will be a little bit more towards the clinical, fine-tuned clinical details. So um, one of the things I wanted to open up with that I think is important is that Dr. Schwartz has incredible, uh, extensive work with uh, inner city uh, folks. And so, Dr. Schwartz, would you tell us a little bit about your work in inner city Chicago? Yeah, again, you're taking me way back. Uh, <laughs> when I got a PhD, I, my first job was at a place called the Institute for Juvenile Research on the west side of Chicago, and it was both a kind of think tank and research institute, but also the population we served was was uh, adolescents mainly from the west side, which is a pretty tough area of Chicago. And so I did that uh, pretty exclusively for the first couple of years that I was developing this and, uh, you know, had to work hard to overcome a lot of the protective parts of my these kids I was working with who didn't trust authorities but also didn't trust white male authorities at all and uh, it was, and didn't want to be vulnerable and would say things like if I'm ever vulnerable on the street I'd be killed which was true and so this model I was developing involved a level of vulnerability. So it was, you know, it, it was actually a great place to start because I really had to find ways to speak to what I call the protective parts of these kids and go over and over how I really get, you have good reasons to not trust me. And, and I would kind of scattershot throw out a lot of the possible reasons. And I understand that. And uh, my job is to earn your trust. And uh, you're the boss. If that never happens, that's okay. And uh, But 
if you were willing to let me help you with this stuff that got you into this trouble, uh, it's, it's very effective and we could heal a lot of the stuff that drives some of these violent parts of you and so on and so on. So that was a, like a wonderful uh, testing ground in a way for learning how to work with what we call protective parts of people. I really appreciate you sharing this. Part of why I'm excited to have you on today is because in the black community, uh, first of all, when you look at how black people statistically are treated medically, um, there's research out there. My wife's a surgical PA. She works in with a heart surgery. And, um, you know, the med center that she works at has done studies um, and they've actually reported re re results on how black people are perceived to not feel pain uh, the same way that other races are. Um, and that's just medically, and that's just one issue. Um, you know, there's baby mortality rates are higher and so forth. Then you have how black, those in the black community feel about therapy anyway, right? right. There's certain things that are just pathologized uh, within the community. Um, I appreciate what you're saying because it's almost as if working in the inner city, and that's a tough place to work, inner city Chicago, you have experience with how to be successful within the black community. I think that's a big question is, okay, what is important when working with folks, let's say in the inner city? Um, and I think one of the things you just shared is if, you know, if you were to trust me, you didn't assume anything, you know, it just feels like your whole approach, which I love, um, is, is very respectful and very human. And so, uh, you know, to encourage those in the black community, um, or at least those working with those in the black community, what would you say was helpful in addition to what you've shared with working in those populations? Yeah, I don't, I don't want to pretend that I was always successful either. Um, but like I was saying, I, I become what I call a hope merchant. And a lot of these kids knew that they were heading in the wrong direction and uh, didn't like the whole gang scene that they were involved in, even though it was really hard to get out of it and and had been forced to come to treatment. They, they weren't happy about that either. And so I, again, would have this combination of messages. One was, I really get why you don't trust me and why you don't want to be here. And, and uh, particularly since you, you're kind of forced to be here. And at the same time, we do have to spend a certain amount of time together. And so I want you to know that there is something I know how to do that would really help you not continue in the direction that you're headed. And I, I promise it works. And I'm not going to foist it on you if, if uh, don't want to do it, I totally understand. And we'll just sit and maybe play chess for, or, you know, go shoot some baskets for the time you have to be with me. And that's totally cool. Uh, and again, as I said, I, I know you have really good reasons to not trust me. So I'm going to earn your trust as best I can, but it may not happen. And that's all okay. And uh, I'm open to hearing any fears you have about doing this kind of work and any stereotypes you have about it. And uh, you know, the if you were to tell somebody you were doing this, what would happen in in your family or what would happen in your community? And we would just kind of chat about all that stuff. And uh, and a lot of times in the beginning, especially. I wouldn't get any answers, you know, every, every answer, every, if I got an answer, it would be, I don't know. I don't know. And I would, <laughs> I would just fill an hour with this, these kinds of speculations about what the kid might be feeling. And, and if that's the case, this is how we'd handle that. And, uh, and, you know, I said, I didn't always succeed, but I succeeded a lot more than the therapists who really tried to pry it out of the kids. Mm. That to me is 
you know, at least on the therapist part, that's about our anxiety. Mm-hmm. And I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to broaden this a little bit. Um, when you think about a therapist and someone who would be called like a discipleship or, you know, a discipler, there's a lot of crossover because our goal is to help. Sometimes our goal is to fix. Um, or we, our method comes out as trying to fix. And there's this humility that is, as we help and permission that we need to get that I'm hearing that you, you developed into a practice and you approached it and I'm sure it became second hand, but you didn't take anything for granted. You didn't assume anything and you didn't use, um, your title, your position in a way that would just confirm what their presuppositions were about you in the first place. And so I just love the humanity (laughs) that you bring. There's a wisdom and a weight that you speak with, with this. So um, whether it be counselor or someone who's a mentor, a spiritual mentor, I think that's really important. And I just, I appreciate you sharing that. Um, yeah, I appreciate you asking because I'm really grateful to those kids. They really taught me this non-coercive, non-pushy approach where I, I, now we say to all protective parts and everybody we work with, you're the boss. We're not going anywhere without your permission, things like that. But I, I learned that from the, those times at IJR in Chicago. Let's get into some of that stuff, the, the, the internal family systems. If you could explain it at the 10,000 foot level for people, how to understand parts of self, because I think it's so useful and it'd be, it would be helpful as we get ready to talk about legacy burdens. Yeah, you know, with with those kids, but also with another population, I was doing a study at that same institute on uh, bulimic kids and their families. And uh, they were the ones who started talking about parts initially. And they would say things like, something bad happens in my life, it triggers this critic who attacks me. And that brings up another part who makes me feel totally young and worthless and empty. And then the binge part comes in to, to take care of me. But the critic attacks me for the binge, and then that brings up this other, the same young, empty, scared, lone part. So the binge has to come back. And as I was listening to that, at first I worried these people were sicker than I thought, but then I listened inside myself and I have them too. And so over time I came to realize that most everybody, not most, everybody has what we call parts, other people call subpersonalities, that, and what we call thinking is often them just interacting inside of us. So if you're, you know, Kyle, if you're facing some kind of dilemma, you'll hear from one voice that says, do it, and another says, don't you dare. And you'll have this kind of debate going on in your head, and you think it's just thinking. But if you were to slow down and focus on one of those at a time and get curious about it, it would tell you a lot about itself and how it's one part of you that has a lot to say, but also has fear and a lot of other emotions. It's like a little personality in there. And so after almost 40 years of doing this, I can safely say that everybody is that way, that people who have the diagnosis multiple personality disorder aren't any different from us, except that their system got really blown apart. So the the parts are very separated from each other and uh, and polarize with each other and there's not much leadership initially but the idea that their subpersonalities is really the same and and that's a radical position in this field it's a tough it's been a tough sell over the years but it as you were saying earlier once you accept it it makes so much sense and people love the idea because it isn't me who's an alcoholic. It isn't me who uh, had hit my wife. It isn't me, it's a part of me. And you would think at first, maybe that's um, you know not being accountable, but it's a part I can get to know and help not have to do these things that uh, get me in trouble. And I can learn about why it is so reactive and I can learn what it protects inside of me and i can actually go to that 
and heal that so it doesn't have to keep taking over this way. So it's very empowering, actually. And um, so, so yeah, the basic position is we're born this way. We're born to have these parts. They all have valuable qualities. There aren't any bad ones. That's the title of my book, is No Bad Parts. Uh, that's coming out in July. And that they start out fairly, it, it, they start out in their naturally valuable states. But trauma and what are called attachment injuries, bad parenting, force them out of their valuable states into roles to protect us that can be quite damaging ultimately. Maybe were necessary when you were young, uh, but then they, they got to get frozen in time, these parts, and they think you're still five years old and, and still need to be protected in the way they needed to back then. And so, as a, and so then they get misidentified. So you start to think, oh, this guy's an alcoholic and he's, you know, just that's who he is. Instead, instead he's got a part that makes him drink to get away from this pain that's in there. And if you get to know the part, it would say, listen, if I don't keep him drunk, the next protector in the hierarchy is suicide. So I'm keeping him alive by keeping him drunk. And it's not going to change until we can heal the pain that drives both of those protectors. So anyway. Appreciate, I appreciate that. When I went to your training, that's what clicked for me <clears throat> is that and as, I, as you had us do our work, you did an excellent job at having us go inside. And what I realized is that I have, so let me just do the three classes for a moment. You have a manager part, firefighters, and then you have exiles. And I would, you would explain that much better than me. Um, but what I realized is one of my manager parts is responsible for a whole tribe of these other parts that, wow, I didn't realize that this was kind of like the sub parent or this is like that, That's right. the, the older sibling amongst all the other parts. And what that's protecting. In other words, when I look at certain clients too, we get wrapped up and distracted into the suicidality. Reality is that that's managing something. That's right. And we haven't been able to get curious about that, and lift that rock up, which we need permission to do as well. <laughs> but uh, I just love it because you're looking at this as a chain of command. Yes. And everybody's got jobs to do. And so anyway, those three, if you could just for a moment, those three classes of parts, I think that would be helpful for the people. Could you describe that for a moment? Yeah. And, and I want to be clear, these are uh, categories of the roles that parts are forced into, not the way they are when, they, when they're not what I call burdened. And let me define burden real quick, too, because when you get traumatized, you start to believe certain extreme beliefs that come with the trauma and you feel these extreme feelings that come into your system from the trauma and all of that attaches to some of these parts who before the trauma were happy-go-lucky and thought you know everybody's safe and i'm you know i like my life and then suddenly they carry the burden of the belief that the world is very dangerous and I can't trust anybody. So that would be one example. And then that part who got so blindsided generally is, and took it in that belief the most, is usually one of these young, lively inner children who before they got hurt, gave you lots of creativity and playfulness and liveliness. But after they take in that burden, uh, we don't want anything to do with them anymore because they can make us so scared or paranoid or or make us so, so raw and sensitive. And so we tend to want to lock them away in inner basements or abysses or cysts. And so I call those the exiles. So and most all of us have a bunch of exiles and I think Black people growing up in this country have lots and lots of exile because of what it's like to deal with this legacy burden of racism. 
And when you get a lot of exiles, then you're going to need a lot of protectors because the world has a way of triggering your exiles. And when they get triggered, you feel that, that intense emotional pain, like flames of emotion that overwhelm you and you can't function, or this sense of worthlessness that you've tried to overcome and keep locked away forever takes over and you, you hide or, and so on. So, so there's a lot of fear of the triggering of the exiles, which makes other parts leave their naturally valuable states and try to manage your life so that the exiles never get triggered. And some of them might do that by not letting you get close to anybody. Anybody get close enough to trigger an exile, let they're out. Or manage your appearance so you never get rejected and you get respect. Or manage your, your um, you know, productivity, manage your achievements, manage your career, so you get accolades to, to counter the worthlessness. So we all get these protectors, some of them become the inner critics, these managers, who are yelling at you to try and get you to behave better so you don't get hurt. Or sometimes they, they try to tear down your confidence so you don't take any risks. So there's a whole range of manager par protectors. Again, it's these extreme roles they're forced into. Some of them keep you in your head all the time. They don't let you feel your body much um, and so on. And they, for many of us, are pretty effective in terms of keeping the exiles contained and not triggered. But the world still can trigger an exile. And when that happens, it's a big emergency because you are feeling consumed by all these emotions and, and extreme beliefs. And so there has to be some other set of parts who impulsively go into action to get you out of that state right now. They're just really allergic to any of these emotions and find ways to distract you until they or dissociate you until the fire burns itself out or get you higher than the flames or douse the flames with the substance or get you to, you know, feel strong and macho to counter the weakness. Um, so th those are the two sets of protector roles, managers, and what we call firefighters, who are fighting these flames of emotion coming from the exiles. And again, firefighters are impulsive in contrast to managers who want to keep everything under control. Firefighters often take you out of control and don't care about the consequences to your relationships or your body. They think they've just got to get you out right now or something terrible is going to happen. So that's the map to the territory. And what I learned the hard way was the importance of respecting these protectors, even the ones that are causing you lots of trouble in your life, learning about why they, they're doing what they're doing and negotiating permission to go to the exiles. And then there's a whole process for healing exiles, for helping them unburden these extreme beliefs and emotions they've been carrying since you were quite young. At which point, it's like a curse is lifted and they become that valuable inner part that uh, they were before they got hurt. I think for a person of faith, this is critical because typically we think of repentance uh, which is really a mind change is the, the the idea behind repentance it doesn't just mean behavior it means that the way you relate to something changes um and so there's a lot of abstinence in uh, folks who become christians or they you know we get baptized you know we swear our allegiance to to, to christ to, to god and we have all these issues we have all these parts there's a story that's being written that that god wants to heal but people pathologize, and, and I know this is going to turn some people off, but we pathologize the wrong thing. So in other words, there's a sinful behavior that we can't be curious, uh, curious enough about because it freaks us out too much and we have too many big feelings about it. When 
if we would just stop and get curious about what that sinful behavior is medicating. I love, I love your, your visual, your, your metaphors. You know, the flames we can't get above, so maybe we douse them with, with a substance. Like, wow. So yeah. there's so many people that are struggling with different things, but because at times we can get so dogmatic and look at the scriptures, look at the text, whatever the, the faith orientation is in this, in this question, in, in this case it would be Christianity, we can look at this with, through new eyes and say, whoa, what does that, that lustful inclination that I have, what is that teaching me about what I didn't get when I was supposed to get it from the people that I was supposed to get it from? What is this urge to become codependent and overfunction? What do I need to know about that? And parts are an incredible asset in terms of creating that discussion, that dialogue. And I think that you just put a name to things and that I think could be some, I think that could be freeing yeah. for many people of faith. Yeah, you're being really clear about all that, Kyle. I really appreciate it because that, you know, I've worked with uh, faith communities. I years ago was invited to come to Jackson, Mississippi and teach IFS to the Reformed Theological Seminary down there. And, wow. And uh, I went down with a lot of apprehension because I was going to come down and say people are basically good and parts are basically good. And I knew their position was people are basically bad and, you know, they need to be redeemed, like you said. And so we had that debate. And at some point I said, but doesn't the Bible say that the image of God is within? And they said, yeah, but that's covered over by all this sin. And I said, well, if you can translate sin into burdens, we're talking about the same thing. Because we have, you and I haven't talked about this yet, but in addition to these parts, there is this essence in all of us that knows it's, it's pure goodness. It's got these great eight C words as qualities, and it knows how to heal inside. And it gets covered over by the parts and their burdens. And so as parts open space, what I call the self with a capital S, emerges and starts to do the healing work and would be equivalent to the image of God or, or God within, from my point of view. So we could make you know, common ground on that. And then at some point, the one of the big professors there, Bill Richardson, got up and said, you know, I kind of know what you're talking about because, you know, Jesus went to the lepers and went to the poor people and went to the outcasts and brought them all back in with love. And that's all you're asking us to do in this inner world having us go to our inner enemies and get to know them and bring them back home. And, and uh, so that was very powerful for me as a translation. Yeah, religion and spirituality can be very much born out of a protector part. I, there was a, and, and we're going to move on to legacy burdens here in just a moment, but there was a Christian attachment study that I had researched when I was going through Christianity and attachment theory. And uh, it was a study that was performed uh, to really look at how does people's attachment to God, what, what affects someone's attachment to God. So you have an adult attachment style and a, a childhood attachment style. What they found that's more predictive and influential on a person's attachment style with God isn't their adult attachment style. Mm -hmm. It's their attachment style from when they were a kid, their that's, kidhood. That's and right. so that's all parts. That's the right. oldest, I mean, I think about the youngest parts are always the oldest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and, and, and when you think about, for a lot of people, they don't understand what's being reenacted. Like, we have a lot of parts parties happening politically. Um, when you think about medical, there's just a lot of different parts happening. And we get hung up on, especially in, in the church, on how people are behaving now. That's, right. That's not the target zone. The target zone is is when they were kids, how they attached. And that is what we see from the research is more predictive and indicative of a person's attachment style spiritually. It's not the adult, it's as a kid. And parts work is a great venue to have that process, I believe. I think parts work is how you figure some of that out and heal it. 
I totally agree. I, I call IFS attachment theory taken inside because we're getting these parts who are so insecurely attached and avoidantly attached to start to attach, not to me, the therapist, but start to attach to the client self so that you become the primary caretaker of your own parts, which then actually frees up your partner to not have to take care of your exiles because you're taking care of them. And that many, many relationship problems are based on the fact that we come out of our families looking for that special person who can make our exiles feel safe or loved. And, and we get really, really dependent on that person where if, if, we, if they could attach to us and feel dependent, feel loved, that, then our partner can be the secondary caretaker rather than the primary one. One of the things in faith communities that we find, um, and this is clear in the research, especially with more emerging or newer movements, is that there's an issue of maturity. So some movements are really good at conversion, but what they really struggle with is maturity. How do you mature people? Well, typically in some of those, 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 uh, those movements, they have a very dependent discipling orientation. So in other words, um, people aren't really taught to think for themselves. I mean, in scripture, we see it very clearly uh, that, um, that the goal is to bring the spirit, the, the conscience of God, to bring that inside of a person. And so you don't need all these legalism you know, you don't need all that anymore because a person now gets that. So as a Christian, you have this processor now spiritually that's connected to God. And so when people out of control and fear and want to grow and things like that, they can create little hierarchies and, you know, yeah. relationships that um, keep people dependent, keep yeah. people stuck, yeah. keep people in a kid place. That's right. And it's so damaging. And then you look out years later and these movements struggle to mature people because it's, it's the, you know, that it's based off of, of permission or compliance. And so I just, oh, as you said that, I thought, wow, discipling relationships is not getting this person to overly depend on me. Yeah. And then I become some sort of fixture in their world. That's unhealthy. Exactly. And yet that has been consistently the experience for many people who are still stuck. Yeah, well, I know you want to talk about legacy burdens. And so let me say some things about that. Yes. So as I was doing this work, I would find that parts carried these beliefs and emotions that had come from clients direct experience in their life. But then there was another set of what we call burdens, belief, extreme beliefs and emotions that clearly didn't come from any experience they'd had. But instead, as we would hear about them, came from their family lineage, uh, might have had some trauma that happened in their family uh, decades ago or even centuries, or, or came from their ethnic group uh, and, and you know tragedies that happened to it and persecutions and so on, or are just floating around in the American culture and we all uh, marinate in and, and get in our parts absorb a lot of those kinds of burdens too. And so that got very exciting to me because first of all, those are actually easier to unload by and large because it didn't happen to you. And the part can just be asked, do you want to carry this or not? Oh, I didn't know I had a choice. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'll, I'll let that go. I don't need that. Um, and, and they're very, uh, you know, because we're so close to them also uh, often, we don't even know that they're driving our beliefs or our actions. And so they're often very powerful organizers, unconscious organizers of our lives. And so unburdening those often has a very dramatic impact on people. So, um, yeah, so I, I, I love now this focus we have on legacy burdens and I've been trying to do group unburdenings. So and it turns out that you can get a group of people together and help them find those things and just send them out. So let's talk about legacy burdens from both perspectives. I've heard you say 
And this is very important because uh, there's a lot of people in the black community that actually just want to know, how do I heal? How do we heal? You've said, I think in the past, and really helping to unburden those uh, in the black community, you have found that to be different than unburdening those in the white community. And can you talk a little bit about the difference? Oh, I don't know that it's different in terms of how to do it. Like there's different sets of legacy burdens that the two groups often carry. So when I'm working with white people, we're generally focused on the parts that carry anti-black belief uh, legacy burdens and also the parts that make them want to not look at the, the history, not look at the pain that has been caused by those anti-black, by the anti-black legacy burden. And also then the parts that keep them from acting, even if they see the pain, there are parts that will come in and, and keep, you know, rationalized in action. So uh, for white people, those are the main groups that I'm helping them focus on and unload. And when I'm working with black people, there is, uh, you know, certainly the legacy burden of slavery, which you alluded to, and all lots of complicated burdens that are associated with that, including a lot of emotional pain and, and justifiable rage and, uh, and also some anti-black, also you find anti-black uh, burdens inside of black people generally, because it's just floating around in our culture. And uh, so it's just, I, I didn't mean to say it was easier or anything, but it's just a different set of burdens. Well, again, um... So I appreciate you detailing the, the front end for, for helping to heal white people from their legacy burdens. What's different? In other words, the anti-black narrative. Um, I just, it's almost though that one is a little bit more internal and the other is a little bit more external. So maybe that's the piece that I kind of caught onto at the training. Um, what would be the difference with helping, let's say, a, a person who's black with their legacy burden? Let's just start with them for a moment. Um, mainly, well, first, a lot of the things we talked about already, if I was a therapist, which would be uh, all the suspicion or lack of trust because I'm white and male, uh, we would have to work with all of that. And then if we got through that and got permission, then to, to find the part that, for example, um, carries anti-black beliefs and unburden that. Uh, so once you get past the protectors, it's not that different. It's just different kinds of burdens. And, and all the burdens from feeling uh, like you don't belong here and feeling the level of oppression and the, you know, the lack of safety with the police and uh, yeah, all, there's just a whole variety of burdens that black people accumulate that white people don't just because this is such a racist culture. Yeah, I mean, as a therapist and researcher, you you, you so comfortably almost, uh, you, you, some of the things you're saying are almost like fighting words yeah. to many people. And this, let's go back to our protector parts, our manager parts and things like that, or even, you know, your, your firefighters. Let's now shift over to the white population. What you've just shared, I think, would be very triggering to people's protector parts, different types of protector parts. Because number one, you are, that statement, this is such a racist culture, I think would be triggering because some people think, well, wait a minute, it's not what you think it is. This is more political. And so now what you've just said clinically, psychologically, can't even be fairly interpreted because we've overly politicized it. And I just, I wonder for you, when dealing with white people, how do you work through uh, some of that Teflon or the, the political sort of uh, merging that immediately starts to happen? How do you deal with some of that? Well, that's what I was saying, that there are parts of white people that are very allergic to the idea that they are racist or that this is a racist culture. 
and have parts that go to great lengths. And you can see that collectively too with the Republican Party um, go to great lengths to paint a totally different picture because it's so abhorrent to them to think of themselves that way. And so my, you know, people who come to me generally want to work with us, but they still have that, that real allergy to, to think of themselves that way. So that's often the first place we start are the parts that want to stay in denial and, and the parts that are trying to protect the white person from feeling bad. And, uh, and you know, there's a process by which we can get to know those parts and help them relax a bit and step back. How do you help with, let's just start with, just we'll make it simple, um, guilt. Like the idea of white guilt, the idea of unearned benefit, which I, I'm someone who, I, I mean this, I don't believe in persecuting someone because of their birth status, because of where they are sort of, uh, where they are oriented in our, our, our society. I, I don't want to punish people for that. Um, I think privilege is about what you do with it more so. Um, but I, I've consistently found, and I've asked many white men, what's it like to be a white male right now? And, and that would be really an endangered species. I, and I have had probably 30, over 30, maybe 40 men that I've talked to consistently. What is it like to be a white man? And there's a lot, I mean, it, you just feel flanked. Like, well, now I, you know. And so what I'm saying is that it, I don't want people to feel that way. Just because you're born into privilege, privilege is not this indictment on your hard work, but it, it so easily is taken that way. And so, um, yeah, guilt. I find that guilt is a huge barrier it's enormous. And so how do you unburden the guilt? How's that work? Yeah, well, it helps a lot. The, the language of parts seems to help a lot. So it's one thing to say, uh, I'm a racist, and I have done this, these very hurtful things to people of color. And that's who I am. And it's quite another thing to say, yeah, there are parts of me that uh, spout this racist stuff inside. And I try my best to keep them out of things, but I can't control them. And, uh, and, and I also, when I really try to lock them away, then it becomes implicit racism. And I, I'm not even aware that I'm doing racist things. Um, but that isn't who I am. That's, that's so these parts of me, and that's not even who the parts are. The parts absorb these burdens that, that just circulate in our culture. And, uh, and they're still very damaging, even though uh, it's not who I am, it's still my responsibility to unburden that stuff. And uh, so that seems to to make people a lot less defensive about it. I think you're absolutely right. Creating some degrees of separation between their self, which can be good, <laughs> and then this other part of them that they don't quite fully understand. And they don't know what to do with that part of themselves. And so you're naming and giving them a way to workshop this part that's blaring. Yeah. And they have guilt about it and they have shame about it. Because it's interesting, you know, I've worked with white supremacists. I've worked with men in the Aryan Brotherhood. Wow. Um, I've wor worked with guys who have swastikas on wow. their bodies. Yeah. And I have found those to be incredibly transforming for me because I was able to learn about a great burden that they were carrying. That's There's right. a lot of regret. That's exactly right. I've worked with a few of those people and we get to their exiles and they had horrible childhoods. And they, you know, they rely on these white supremacist parts to feel better about themselves uh, and they need a scapegoat and and so on and and you heal their exiles and those protectors are all become open to unloading the legacy burdens they carry so yeah i'm very hopeful about this as a, a way to work with that population for sure 
Well, I'll just say this. The, the work that you're doing is essential. You know, I, I would consider you, and especially therapeutically, an essential worker. <laughs> because, um, you know, you think about 2020, uh, it just came with a whole host of, I mean, it's just the, the blast radius is enormous. Um, and I think that what you're doing is essential because we need an, a new way to think about some of these things. Um, people are going to be pursuing more, you know, mental health than they ever have. Um, and it's becoming more accepted and acceptable. And so what you're doing is you're giving something that I really think, and I feel passionate about, that works with people who have a faith orientation as well, very, yeah. very well. Um, and, and I think that's something that I, and also it, it works really well with people who need to work through either in and out of the church, racial issues. Um, I'm going to be writing a book with a guy uh, by the name of Mike Burns called The Big Lie. And we're going to be getting into the, like the very, like the origin story of racism back to like Augustine and stuff like that. Um, and I'm coming in with the, the racialized trauma perspective and I, you better believe I'm going to be inserting, uh, this legacy burden piece, uh, into how to triage these types of things in the church and think of having a righteous nature and a sinful nature and helping people to externalize scripture already helps us. This, I think even more tangibly helps us extend into that work. So yeah, I, I, I consider you essential in the work that you're doing. Uh, again, I'm honored by that, Kyle. And I would agree because sin has such a negative connotation that it, it w makes you want to fight it. You, you want to fight your sinful nature, which are just these parts that are trying to protect you that, and also carry these. I mean, the burdens themselves are sinful but you're trying to throw the baby out with the bathwater in the process. And that's a huge mistake that not only Christianity has made, but psychotherapy in general has made. So that's helpful because, um, you know, not, not that we should do a food fight, but I mean, I, I believe that, <laughs> I believe that psychology is holding bad theology, bad theology accountable. I mean, we're seeing that. Um, but I also think that, every psychological theory has a theological position. You can't not, not have a belief system about God, so to speak. And the question is, does it have a good one? Mm -hmm. And um, the idea of sin, I think, again, people have developed their theology of sin, but they have a very underdeveloped theology of shame. Mm -hmm. And what people want to know is, okay, great. Does the church give me a place to put my shame? And I think without parts, I think it's hard to say yes. <laughs> which is why I'm passionate about it. I think parts language are an incredible, it's a narrative, you know, that helps us with this, this sin thing that we're trying to figure out. Yeah. Well, it's really nice that you get it so deeply. I appreciate it. Oh, this is, I could continue. And I, I tell you, I, I look forward to, you know, on maybe a different level having a different um conversation with you i have so much more i'd like to love to talk with you about um can you just tell us a little bit about um your book coming up i think it's called no bad parts no bad parts um and it's got a subtitle that i can't pull up at the moment around uh, healing trauma and re restoring wholeness something like that and uh yeah it it, it is a more spiritual uh, take on IFS that I've written for the public and contains a lot of uh, exercises so people can, can test it out experientially what I'm saying and uh, yeah I feel good about it well you know you've written uh, you've written quite a few books and so at this point uh, you know we're getting a lot of the, the, the good I mean we're just getting all the good stuff I mean um, I'm excited about that. The other thing I, I'd love for you to share for therapists who are watching, um, are there any trainings? Can you tell us a little bit about if somebody wants to explore getting trained in IFS, how that process might work for some of us that are interested? Yeah, I appreciate the interest again. I have the kind of good problem that trainings are very hard to get into now because there's so much interest. We have 7,000 people on a waiting list, so. Wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> So, oh my gosh. So in the meantime, we have an online, what's called the Online Circle Program, which you can find off our website, which is a year subscription and you get uh, a, 
a lecture like this from me every month and one from one of my lead trainers and a lot of videos and other materials. And, and people love that program. So, um, but we're scrambling to get more trainers and more trainers trainings going. And, uh, and I'm proud to say we have uh, a lot of people of color coming up uh, to be trainers. Well, I just want to say, um, and I say this to all my guests, that we are with you and God is for you. I believe that what you're doing is a, a very blessed work. And I think that it's um, really going to help some people get free, Re regardless of what, where they are and their faith and orientation. I think that there's always a process ahead of us. Um, and and I'm just very grateful that you came and, and joined me today. I appreciate your time. I appreciate it too, Kyle. It's been uh, great to get to know you better and uh, look forward to, forward to further adventures. Absolutely. Well, if you stuck with us the entire video, I just want to thank you. Uh, thank you so much for uh, listening. And I know some of you guys, I've gotten comments, people go through and they listen to these videos multiple times. I can't believe it. I'm humbled and honored by that. Um, please continue to like, subscribe and share as you were doing. The channel has continued to grow. And I'm very excited about that. And uh, I will see you guys next time.